Welcome to the special meeting of the Bakersfield City Council. Now speaking, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to call to order the 4 p.m. meeting of May 20th, 2020. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Parlier. Here. Councilmember Rivera. Here. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Here. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. And Councilmember Sullivan. Here. Thank you. As you're aware, on March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to to the threat of COVID. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to public meetings such as this. And as such, Council Members Smith and Weir are participating by phone, and all council votes tonight will be counted, conducted by roll call. Due to the governor's executive order, which waived the requirement for the physical presence of the public in light of the pandemic. The public comments are now being encouraged to be made by email and phone call to the city clerk. Those received in such a manner have been provided already to the council. So if people now want to speak in person, uh, they will be welcome during this time. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? None have been received. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under workshops, item A, homeless point in time count update. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Yeah, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, at the request of Council, we did ask our um, local continuum of care folks to come and provide us an update on our point in time count. And so we'll turn the time over to Anna. Welcome, please introduce yourself and go ahead. It's the dynamic duo. A joint presentation, that's great. Yes, we're trying to do a joint uh, presentation and social distance um, affectionately as well at the same time. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Lavin. I'm the executive director of the Bakersfield Kern Regional Homeless Collaborative. Uh, and with me today we have Deb Johnson, uh, who is both the chair of our governing board as well as the executive director Oh, President, I'm sorry. I, I knew it was some high level title, um, but President and CEO of CVAF. Um, so she has a lots of fantastic expertise and knowledge to share as well. Um, so today we wanted to share with you the results of the point in time count um, that were held here in January, uh, both in Bakersfield as well as uh, the whole of Kern County. And so with that, uh, Deb is gonna share with us the first slide. Good afternoon, um, council members and the Honorable Mayor Go. It's my pleasure to be here today. So it's no surprise when we got our results back for our point in time count that we did see a 19% increase in homelessness, um, both in Metro Bakersfield and the County of Kern. Um, we uh, showed a 25% increase in unsheltered homeless persons, and that's somebody that's living in a place not meant for ha human habitation. There was a 10% increase in sheltered homeless persons, which means that the shelters that we do have with shelter beds and transitional housing uh, used capacity a little bit better than in our 2019 count. Mm -hmm. I'm very honored because as a homeless veteran provider to share that we showed a 14% decrease in veteran homelessness in Kern County. And we have, um, for over a year, sustained zero chronically homeless veterans in Kern County as well. Probably the most alarming number of our point in time data is that 88% of our homeless is that, that was observed during that point in time was in Metro Bakersfield. Um, and that there is, was a 14% increase in our point in time volunteers. That is very significant. Um, for us to be able to have an increase in volunteers, which helps us um, as we move in. Anna will talk a little bit more about um, the correlation of the data of volunteers and our numbers. 
So one of the things that it's important to recognize is that our methodology metho methodology did change in, um, in 2017. Um, and so for that reason, uh, we felt like showing or talking a little bit more closely about the last three years worth of data uh, is, is particularly important. Um, with that, what you'll see there in the graph is um, in, the, in the darker green uh, are the number of uh, those who were found to be sheltered and homeless. Uh, and the sort of the lighter yellowish green color is, of course, you can see a pretty drastic slope there. Uh, that represents those folks who were considered to be unsheltered at the time. And uh, one of the things that really stands out about this graph is that you can see um, that significant increase that we've seen um, both uh, last year in 2019 and then to some degree this last year in, in 2020 is really m almost entirely represented by uh, folks who are unsheltered. And so when we think about next year and what we might see in 2021 for our point in time count, there are a couple of things that you may want to be aware of. One is that we anticipate 562 uh, new beds coming online, and those will be through a variety of sources. Obviously, we have the navigation centers both from the city and the county coming online, uh, as well as per permanent housing and transitional housing beds. So that graph will change somewhat uh, when we look at next year. But of course, the biggest area that we really want to focus our attentions and our strategies is on those who are considered to be unsheltered. Uh, we can certainly consider or anticipate that next year um, our current economic recession, as well as the impacts of the oil industry, um, will likely have an impact um, potentially increasing, uh, continuing to increase that unsheltered number. Um, but of course, we won't know yet until uh, we have that point in time count in 2021. I, I wanted to point out as well, I wanna thank um, the city for allowing a lot of its employees to be able to participate in the count. I know several members of the council were there and it's critically important that you are kind of like boots on the ground to see the work that we're doing and what we're attempting to do because realistically that unsheltered count happened in four hours. So we talk about it being a one day event, but it's really, we counted over 1,004 people in a four hour period. So again, we talked about the increase of volunteers up here um, with a trend to be more accurate, longer homeless counts. I'm gonna go back a little bit to 2018. Anna had referenced that our point in time methodology for counting changed. Prior to that, our count, we kind of conducted our count on a 24 hour period. And in 2018, we changed it to a dusk till dawn methodology, which HUD required us to do, which meant we started at 8 p.m. on one night and ended at 8 a.m. the following morning. The 8 p.m. started with the sheltered count, which was a little bit easier to do. It was volunteers going into our um, transitional housing programs and our shelters to count the people there. And then at four o'clock, from four to eight o'clock in the morning to be able to do that count. In 2018, remember strategically, I had this huge area. And my team was out, we were actually around Garza Circle. We found an encampment that we had never seen before. And we kind of got stuck there. And we called back to headquarters and said, we need help. There's no way we're gonna be able to get through our whole territory in the amount of time that's allotted. And there was nobody to help. So that was putting the, the plea in the call to action to have more people in our community step up and do that count. So what that allowed us to do with more volunteers is take those big areas, cut them down so we were able to concentrate in areas now where we see local hotspots um, and where Flood Street Outreach Team has been able to go in. So that's what's really key and critical from that 2018 to 2019. Um, the spike in volunteers to the spike of homeless is we had more people on the streets to be able to conduct that count. Um, actually, I'm gonna let you go to them. I, I have covered it all. 
So what are some of the takeaways from the 2020 um, point in time count? Um, I think one is uh, we've certainly grown to understand that our shelters and our low barrier navigation centers that are coming on later this year are critical elements to solving uh, homelessness within our community. Um, what we know is that when we have more beds, we create stability and through that stability, we were are able to increase efficiency of the wraparound services that we know are also so drastically needed to help serve this particular group of folks. Um, one of the things that we know is incredibly important, um, as I've learned from Deb and others, are something called the three Ps. The three Ps include property, partners, and especially pets. And so one of the things that we know um, that will have a strong benefit for us with the two navigation centers that are coming online, or that did, the counties came online now, um, and that we're anticipating with the city as well later this year, is being able to better address those three Ps. Um, those are oftentimes the items or the areas of concern for someone who is experiencing homeless that doesn't allow them or causes a barrier for them to choose to access stability and shelter. And as we know, that stability is so incredibly critical um, in order to increase and create effectiveness uh, in the services that we're able to provide. Um, what we would like to really have you know is that um, in addition to that, of course, we're in unusual times. Uh, what I did want to share with all of you is that uh, I'm extraordinarily proud of all of the providers in our network and our collaboration who have immediately jumped um, to ensure the safety and health of both the staff who are providing services as well as the people who they are serving uh, during this pandemic. And I also want to, of course, thank the city and the county for their extraordinary work with us and helping to navigate all of that. Um, in closing, what we are really hoping that we will be able to do is to meet with each of the city council members um, to talk a little bit more about how homelessness uh, impacts your particular ward. And in addition to that, really emphasize that the point in time count is really one uh, data set that we look at. We have something called system performance measures, which gives us a much stronger uh, indication uh, over the course of an entire year or several years of how effective our services are. And what we're hoping that we might be able to do, in addition to talking with each of you individually, is come back for another presentation in the future to talk a little bit more about what those system performance measures um, really give us in terms of getting a better and clearer picture of uh, homeland, homelessness within Metro Bakersfield. Again, as the governing board chair, I really want to thank you for your time and attention. It really has been an honor to be able to work with Anna um, and the other agencies um, through, the, uh, through the course of this year. Never thought that we would be going through a pandemic and changing everything that we're doing. But it's really critical that if you have questions and concerns that you reach out to us and you talk to us directly so we can take that back to our partner agencies and address those concerns because we don't know what other people are seeing and saying and it's critical for us to be able to respond um, in a very thought out um, manner and to really get good information out to not only you but um, the, the people in the city of Bakersfield. Thank you, Ms. Slavin. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. If you'll stay up there, uh, we're going to go first to the public for comments, and then we'll come to the council for further comments. So, Madam Clerk, did you happen to receive any public speaker cards on this workshop? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on this topic? For those who are viewing online, if you'd like to comment, you're welcome to submit an email to the City Council via the City Clerk. So now, Councilmember Gonzalez, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, let me congratulate Dr. Lavin on her uh, recent appointment as the uh, Executive Director of the Regional Homeless Collaborative. I'm uh, very excited to have you in your new position, and thank you, Ms. Johnson, for participating today. You know, I'm, I'm very thrilled that we have this new collaborative and new structure, and there's been a lot of us who've been working behind the scenes 
to to see this happen and I think it just strengthens our response in the community. So thank you both for all their for your work and um, and thank you for being here being here today. I just wanted to take a few moments and, and make a few observations, if I may, okay. and perhaps get your reactions. Uh, one of the things that's really important, one of the data points that's really uh, important for me as I look at this from the city's perspective is, is the rate of change uh, in the number of unsheltered people in Metro Bakersfield, uh, because clearly we're, we're concerned with what happens within the city. Obviously, we're concerned what happens countywide, but really for our purposes, we want to look at the Metro Bakersfield, and there has been a 31% increase, I just wanted to underscore that, uh, in the number of unsheltered people uh, in, in Metro Bakersfield year after year. I think that's an important point to make. Uh, I appreciate your slide, uh, increase in unsheltered homeless persons observed um, uh, it drives overall growth and you, you look at the number of people who are unsheltered and those who are sheltered. Um, if I make a request, if I may, uh, in the future, if we can look at the percentages of, of people who are unsheltered and, and really analyze that, that change. What I'm trying to get at is uh, we will increase our capacity in the number of shelter beds uh, by the end of this year. We'll, we'll double the number of shelter beds in our community. That's a great thing. But at the same time, there's still an inflow of people who are becoming homeless. And we have to do more work to prevent homelessness. There are a lot of other things that, that, that are required as a city. And so, you know, to the citizen in the community, uh, we may increase uh, capacity in homeless shelters, we may be able to fill beds, but the community may not see a difference from the day to day. That, that impact may still be there, and so that's a concern. And I wanna be sure that we find some good measures so that we can really progress, uh, we can really measure our progress over time. It, um, and, and so I think one of the last comments that Anna made is really critical. So the point in time count, again, this is 12 hours of data. Where our system performance through our HMIS system called Homeless Management Information Systems tra tracks homeless people, the inflow and the outflow, outflow for a year. Mm -hmm. That is the data that we truly want to analyze. The point in time is a HUD requirement. We have to do that for their application. But I agree with you, but as a city and a community, let's look at system performance measures right. and look at what that inflow and that outflow looks like for a year instead. Of, like a lot of people really get caught on point in time as the number of homeless, right. and it's not. It is a snapshot in time. So that is why we would love to come back um, when we get an opportunity to talk about system performance measures and then how we as a COC or a continuum of care makes adjustments and modifications to our work to um, really focus on system performance measures. Um, I, I think that that would be beneficial. It'll shed a new light on some of the numbers and how our system um, is impactful. We need to do a better job, I think, in communicating with the media on that because what you said is so true in terms of we are always hyping up the point in time kind of, it's, in, it's important, but then we forget about the ongoing and that that is really what's much more meaningful. Yeah, and, and that's sort of my point. I think we need to crystallize better performance indicators and, and bring those to the forefront. And, and use the city council and, and these presentations, hopefully they're quarterly presentations, as the platform to really lift up those, you know, those performance measures. I think it's important for us to really get clarity on, on how we're doing. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make, and, and you know, I appreciate the fact that there have been a number of volunteers that participated. I was out there. Uh, several of us were, were out there that morning. Um, the rate the, the, inc the rate of increase, the rate of change for the number of volunteers was 14% year after year. The year prior, from 2018 to 2019, there was a 100% increase. Mm -hmm. All right, so I looked at the numbers of unsheltered people. That growth rate, again, for Metro Bakersfield was 31%. So 
I, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that the reason why the numbers have increased was because of the numbers of a number of volunteers have increased. Because if you take a look at that rate of change, it's not proportionate. So I, I um, just want to celebrate the fact that we have more volunteers, but also, also caution us from making too many conclusions as to why those numbers have increased. So I wondered if you had any observations regarding that. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, um, we don't want to overemphasize one particular point of yeah. data, right? Um, but the other piece is what we think is going on or has gone on this year and last year is that because we have had an increase in volunteers, we are more likely to have had a slightly more accurate count, right? So as Deb described in her own personal experience a number of years ago, the amount of terrain to cover in a four hour period of time for a small team wasn't sufficient. Uh, they, they, they were understaffed, right? And so um, I, I think what we're seeing now is a slightly better representation of the overall picture as opposed to an increase, right? Um, so this year and last year is probably a slightly truer tr actual picture. And that had we had more volunteers, let's say three, four years ago, and a consistent methodology um, that we are likely to have seen a fairly similar, perhaps a slightly less number. Um, what we like to see though is what the number is next year. So typically when you're looking for a data trend, you'd, like, you'd look for at least three points that are consistent. So if we can get the same number of volunteers next year, um, that will probably give us a, a slightly truer picture. Although, of course, we have a very large variable uh, and factor that none of us had predicted in the pandemic. Um, and so uh, it's entirely possible that we could see another increase next year as a result of that. Um, because I think you really hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, uh, and when you were talking a little bit about the inflow and the outflow. So what I have seen so far in, in the few months that I've been on board is that our providers are, are actually pretty efficient at getting folks connected to um, longer range housing. They are still working their tails off, um, getting folks who have a fair number of barriers, if we pull it, put it mildly, um, to accessing things like apartments, um, but getting them housed in those kinds of spaces. Uh, but the trick is how many people do we have entering on the front end, right, um, into that unfortunate pipeline of experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. And our prediction, I mean, we don't know yet, mm -hmm. but um, the thought process is that with a number of months this year where folks are um, unemployed, unable to pay for rent, unable to pay for utilities. We know that there are some things in the works. We are obviously are really trying to be as responsive as we can, the city and the county as well, um, for which we're grateful, but the reality is there may still have an impact there. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you're right. Uh, we don't want to overemphasize uh, that, that there is an increase in volunteers and that's the only reason why we have that number. That's probably just simply a truer look and view than what we may have had three, four, or five years ago as a result of being, having not enough volunteers, right? Okay. I appreciate that. And my last comment, if I may, Mayor, is uh, I'd just like to say that, you know, there are really uh, a few fundamental components of an effective homeless system. There's prevention, uh, there's outreach and assessment, there's emergency shelters, permanent supportive housing, per permanent affordable housing, and then supportive services. And so for the purposes of, of this council and for policy making and budget priorities in the future, I would like to request that you, you come back on a quarterly basis um, and update us on the available capacity of each component um, of the system and also the linkages among those components uh, that facilitate the movement of individuals through the pipeline toward permanent housing. So again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. I, I do think that the clarity that you are now bringing forward in the difference between the 2018 and 2019 is important with volunteers. Our media somehow always latches on to the comparison of the 2018 versus 2019. And that's not a fair comparison, because you know even with the 300 that we had in 2019, we still couldn't count everyone. So, so to put that in perspective, I, there was a significant increase in volunteers, and I think it's helpful to point 
that out. And really, 2019 becomes our baseline for, for that number. So uh, we have a good starting point there for comparison. Council Member Parlier. Thanks, Mayor. First of all, I'm going to make a motion to receive and file this item. Excuse me. <clears throat> I want to thank you so much for all your hard work. I mean, talk about an uphill battle. I mean, every day you wake up and, uh, you know, you think you put one person in a bed and there's two more behind them and trying to find that availability. And uh, the partnership, stakeholder uh, part that you've been with the community and with the city and with the county and all of us working together uh, will hopefully, I don't know if we'll ever resolve it, but uh, get our hands around it a little more firmer as we're going forward. Uh, I just had a quick question or really maybe more of a follow-up and maybe this is more directed towards the city too, that uh, and data points were mentioned, uh, system performance numbers, and you also men mentioned your homeless management system. Uh, I think we could do better on our analytics. Uh, I've gone out with the pit count, uh, I've gone out with the police impact team and uh, seen firsthand uh, the homeless problem and the homeless uh, people that they deal with. Uh, when I was out fairly recently, right before COVID struck, uh, I was in my area, I made contact with uh, six homeless people, and two of the six were from out of area. One was from LA and one was from a beach community. Uh, both of them wanted, one from LA said he had a job if he just get back there. Another one wanted to get home to what he thought would be family resources, but there was no availability for him to get there that they were aware of, and I really wasn't aware of that availability either. Is there anything in the works to try and help facilitate that with, with somebody that can maybe make that connection or get to that job or get back to that family resource? So I, like on the veteran end, because that's the, the subpopulation that, that I work in, um, the VA has recognized that if there's somebody in our community that wants to transfer into another community, there's funding available. Um, as long as that connection is made. It's not just a matter of giving someone a bus pass and that they get to pass them um, onto right. another community or system of care, because that's not right. There has to be a connection on the other end. But in a non-veteran setting, there's no funding available in our community to be able to transport somebody who, who would like to go into another community. Um, it's not allowable in our HUD funding, so that's part of our challenge when we're looking at barriers for our providers is how do we get somebody like that who's willing to step up and pay for that? So I know that Jim Wheeler with Flood Bakersfield Ministries has talked um, in the COC about wanting to try to develop that type of a program, but we haven't got there yet, but there's definitely a need. So a lot of it is just funding capacity, it's not, it, we have recognized the need, but we just don't have funding capacity at this time. Okay, um, excuse me, <clears throat> again. One of the people, the, when the officer ran the person to see where they were from, and he clearly stated he was from out of area, but it came back with the Bakersfield address, he came back to the homeless shelter. And uh, when I had a follow-up conversation with the police officer, I go, so he's from out of area, but he goes, yeah, whenever, when somebody goes to the homeless shelter, that effectively becomes their, their new address. So at that point, they're a basic Bakersfield resident. So I was wondering if there's a way, as we go forward again with our analytics, to maybe have a subset or bifurcate that information a little bit. So we, just to do a little follow-up, what you, you said on, um, we don't want to impose our homeless on other communities, but we'd like to have that statistical information. If any other communities are potentially doing that to us, it'd be nice to be able to, to track that a little bit too. Very good point. Um, our system, HMIS does not track that type of information and data, um, and we really don't do it through the point in time count either. We ask a question like, you know, were they homeless prior to coming? Uh, or where they came from, were they homeless prior to coming into Bakersfield and stuff like that. So we do need to maybe try to do a deeper dive um, and start asking some of those questions, but we haven't gotten there yet. 
but the Homeless Collaborative has no indication that people are being bused into the community. Some people choose to come into our community for family, for employment, or for other reasons. Um, and um, like I said, that's not really something that we're tracking specifically, but I can, we can check with our HMIS system administrator and see if that's something that we could add into the data. Is there anything we could do as a city to maybe help that or really help in any direction that we're not doing right now? We'll get back to you <laughs> at, a, at our next besides, quarterly besides presentation. <laughs> so Ms. Johnson, are, yeah. are you involved with the expansion of the HMIS working with the Adventist health team and all? We had met, I think you were a part of those meetings, where we had talked about adding extra features, just would use that as the core, but expanding that and supporting it in another way. I know that HMIS, you have to report for the feds a certain way, but other components uh, that we want to track, such as this, uh, just using that as a core and then expanding so that we're not starting all over again with another system. So maybe we can continue those conversations. I know we started that before COVID. Well, the, the veteran data elements are the same. It's just, you know, the homeless veteran population, that's my, sub, I'm a subject matter, matter expert, so I don't want to talk about um, population that I'm not as familiar with. But I, we would have to look to see whether HMIS has the capacity to be able to ask like some of those other questions about um, where people are coming from. Because the challenge really is if somebody came from LA um, six months ago and are in Bakersfield, are they a Bakersfield resident or are they an LA resident? So there's some fundamental questions that we really need to ask before we try to develop a system around it. Mm -hmm. um, so point taken, I'll, I'll bring that back um, to the HMIS committee and let, I'll, I'll see if we can build something into that. And I guess the analytics are a little bit more than that too. As a, especially downtown, we've had really good efforts with our rapid response teams and uh, other efforts, but uh, that potentially as you squeeze the balloon can cause bulges potentially in other areas of the city. And besides analytics of maybe where folks are from, uh, what's the trending? Because I heard one person that uh, actually was a group that went out and did a pit count and they kind of went to where their historic honey hole would have been for homeless and they weren't there. And they were kind of, whoa, where'd they go? You know, they know they're still around somewhere, but to be able to statistically track kind of or where we're getting bulges and where resources need to be as they kind of uh, matur matriculate through the city. So uh, that was a perfect segue for me to talk a little bit about the technology we did use this year. Um, for those who participated, you know that we have a heat map that we did use. Um, there was an app that uh, everybody could have on their phone if that's what they were able or interested in doing. Um, so we have used that heat map actually um, a number of times, um, particularly under the pandemic circumstances where we've um, try to talk through particular strategies unique to neighborhoods around um, how, how do you how do you ensure the health and safety of folks who now no longer have access to any restroom, for example, um, or their f traditional food sources are no longer available, um, and and they don't have a car to go through the drive-through food bank option, right? Um, so we have definitely continued to look at the use of technology and. Um, the way of being able to visualize data. Um, so the heat map was one example of that, um, and we're continuing to explore other options as well. Um, the other thing I would say is that while the pit count is somewhat limited in the data, it does indicate that 96 to 98% of folks consistently indicate that their former place of residence was Kern County. So while we're more than happy to continue to explore um, how to ensure that folks who have other communities that they would call home are able to return to those spaces. What I do think we have to kind of make sure that we own is that the folks who are experiencing homelessness within Bakersfield and Kern County really prime mostly come from here. 
these are our community members, these are our, um, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. And so, um, again, we we'll absolutely, I think that there's always um, potential for us to look at additional data sets. And we've added some additional modules under COVID-19 circumstances, so I expect that we should be able to fairly easily start to build something else out if that data is helpful. Um, so we can definitely explore that. But I, I want us to be mindful that the vast majority of those who are experiencing homelessness, um, at least in the pit count, indicate that their home is, is Bakersfield or Kern County. Well, that's fine, but I always think there's room for improvement. Yeah, and, absolutely. And as we go yeah. forward and our, as our numbers continue to grow, yeah. I think we can't make a definitive opinion unless we have proper analytics. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your hard work again. Thank you. Councilmember Smith, Councilmember Weir, do you wish to comment? Yes, I have a comment. It's Bob Smith. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your work. Uh, obviously very important to the community. Uh, and I look forward to the individual meetings. I guess I've, the, the metrics, the analytics they've been talking about is, is my main question that we always, we always get this you know, the increase in homelessness. And when I speak with the Bakersfield Homeless Center and the Housing Collaborative, uh, they talk about it, and the, the Property Owners Association talk about how many people they've moved out of homelessness into housing. So, I mean, that number is very important, you know, what, and it's kind of the success stories. But, and then on the other side, that's Councilmember Gonzalez mentioned, you know, what, what are we doing for prevention? But if, if we don't know the, the turnover and then the implication is always, well, we had, you know, we had a thousand last year and we have 300 more this year. So, you know, the, those thousand are still there and we've added 300 to it, which I know is not the case. So do, do you have a number in your head or are you aware of, of how many people we actually housed in the last year? I, I apologize for the purposes of this presentation. We just focused on point in time. That would come in our next presentation under system performance measure. Um, you know, we had debated whether or not to talk about that, but when you talk about two completely different sets of data elements, people would get really confused. So we thought system performance measure should be a separate conversation, um, but we can definitely break it down for you at that point in time when we come back and do another presentation. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Okay, great. Thanks. Council Member Weir, do you wish to comment? No, thanks. Okay. You have a motion to receive and file. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Sullivan? Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Ms. Levin. Appreciate it. Next item, please. <clears throat> Under closed session, we have one item, conference with labor negotiator. We at the attorney's request, we receive a memorandum removing closed session item pertaining to the Gilberto Fiardo versus City of Bakersfield item. Thank you. So we are now moving to closed session. <laughs> 